following the statement by the RCGP regarding their opposition to the use of physician associates. They acknowledged that there are about 2,000 PAs currently working in general practice and that they were going to release some scope documents to help current GPs employing physician associates. This document is broken down, I think, in three main sections. Induction, preceptorship, supervision, and scope of practice. The opposition of physician associates by the RCGP and even this guidance they've released, they are not legal documents as such. If a general practitioner decides to do everything contrary to what this guidance is saying, they are free to do it. However, when the proverbial, you know what, hits the fan, the defense one will be able to mount will be very, very porous. Personally, I'm not interested in the induction and perceptorship. They've already told their members not to recruit physician associates. And two, they've told you they oppose the use of physician associates in primary care. I don't think there'll be much hiring. On supervision, they say there must be a clinical supervisor and there must be an educational supervisor. The interesting thing about the supervision is the individual supervising the physician associates must be trained to supervise the physician associates. When the rubber hits the road and something goes wrong, whoever is supervising you will definitely be asked that question. As you know, physician associates are only able to work because of the delegation clause. For a doctor to delegate, they must ensure that the person is trained in it, is competent in it, has the skills to do that. If they do this delegation in line with their guidance, and anything goes wrong, they don't bear any responsibilities for the action or inaction of the physician associate. However, they remain responsible for the general management of the patient. As long as everything is going fine, the delegation is appropriate. When things go left, someone will inevitably ask you, did you delegate appropriately? And then you have questions to answer. I'm saying this for you to understand that the doctor supervising you is taking on a non-negligible medical legal risk. This is the whole crux of the matter. Who gets Gets blamed when X goes wrong. And you have to ask yourself how many doctors are willing to put their neck on the chopping block for you or I. I'm a physician associate just like you. The position we are in, I don't want to be in it and I definitely know you don't want to be in it. There are benefits, they can keep us working, doing what we do and then there are risks. There are a lot of layers, a lot of red tape. Your scope of practice is very narrow. For one, they say physician associates should not see patients in primary care below the age of 16. Physician associates should not be working in out of hours and should not work as locums in general practice. If you work in urgent care, you probably probably should not be doing that job either. They believe we shouldn't deal with mental health patients. Depression, anxiety, bipolar, we have no business. Further went on to say we have no business handling gynecological problems. So let's say a patient comes in, they did some bloods, probably anemic, they're of reproductive age, you question them, pictures suggest menorrhagia, you have no business proceeding further. Remember how I told you guys I tried my best to learn how to read ECGs and interpret them. Based on this scope of practice, once again, we have no business interpreting ECGs. <laughs> oh god bro, it's difficult. The tone of this scope of practice and this document, it's like when you've seen a patient and they need some further investigations doing and you write a referral to secondary care. If in the past the specialist have already written in a letter where they've highlighted how the patient is supposed to be treated when X or Y presents and you haven't seen it, they can sometimes put it in the form of as per letter dated 24th October 1942, kind regards. Because the guys have told you, we don't think there is a role for them in the first place. But if you are going to keep them there, this is what you have to go through to keep them there. And even if they are there, they can only do this much. According to this document, physician associates technically are not supposed to see undifferentiated patients unless it has been triaged by a general practitioner. It's just one week after the other for a patient to be seen by a physician associate. If a doctor is going to speak with a patient in the morning to ascertain that this is just a common sore throat, they might as well decide to give them whatever medication they deem appropriate at the time. You've done the whole consultation. This document is very very narrow if you compare the scope of this document to that of the para the one that sets the competencies of the physician associate they are completely at odds they say the physician associate must not exceed the scope highlighted in the document and the physician associate must not exceed the scope of their clinical supervisor so the document tells you all that they think you can safely do clinical supervisor you can further limit it whatever we thought we went to university to go study they don't agree with that is the current state of affairs of physician associates in primary care there will be physician associates going to placements this monday during this week what exactly 
would they be expecting you to do? The document says physician associates should not see presentations like headache, should not see presentations like abdominal pain. It says that the seven minor illnesses in the pharmacy first are a good starting point for physician associates. What sort of discussion are the universities having with these students right now? If I were still a student, I would be asking some questions. So boss, wh wh what do we do now? The college is telling them you shouldn't be there in the first place and they shouldn't hire you. And if they hire you, you must be severely restricted. What are you even doing the placement there for? Some tough decisions will need to be made. If you were to reverse the roles, and I told you, we are going to employ somebody with all these red tapes and you carry all these risks. You would come to some logical conclusions that may not necessarily benefit the person you're employing. That is the reality we are dealing with. Redundancy may not be necessarily out of the picture. Some people say we knew what we were getting ourselves into. Now I beg to differ. Physician associates are trained in universities. We were not taught by shadowy institutions. This is not Hogwarts. These are medical schools. These are universities. You believe every check and balance has been done, every due diligence, and you sincerely believe you are learning a set of skills to do a given job. We were not taught by shadowy figures, people you could not trust. We were taught by doctors. We did our placements with doctors. These same doctors that are the standards, that have done their five years of medical school, have done their foundation years, have done their post-graduation qualifications to have all the post-nominals in the world, FRCP, EM, MR, all of them. These are the guys that taught us. We were not taught by people from the humanities who were trying to develop an alternative way to care for human beings. No, we were taught by you guys and your colleagues. We trusted the NHS, Health Education England, the Department of Health. It's hard for people to understand this one of physician associates. I think there are some physician associates who have gone into medicine. Maybe they will have a better understanding of this. It would be like you go to medical school X. You've gone through all the five years. You are working now as a foundation doctor. Then suddenly someone comes and tells you, mate, you, you cannot do that job. You will ask, why can't I do that job? But I just finished my medical school. Yeah, that is true, but your medical school is not recognized. GMC was aware of my medical school. NHS was aware of my medical school. All the checks and balances one must do to make sure it's a legit course, they were there and you are told, nope, you wouldn't be surprised if that individual asks some questions. This idea that we knew what we were getting ourselves into. What were we getting ourselves into? 99% of physician associates coming into this course have no idea of this quagmire, and then you are thrown into this mess as if you are part of a well-organized orchestration to reduce standards in medicine, you don't care about patients, you are called quacks, you are called charlatans. I must admit, some of our colleagues make it difficult to defend ourselves. We don't prescribe, and then you find out some people have been prescribing. We don't order ionizing radiations, then you find out some people have been ordering ionizing radiations, and those are legitimate concerns, and there is no way to skirt around it. It takes a doctor five years to go to medical school, two years to do foundation, they need to do three years before they are allowed to sit in the GP. Why are physician associates allowed to do that without that? My friend, I don't know why. We did not make that decision. But those that have legitimate concerns, fair enough, have the legitimate concerns, but I always think you are dealing with human beings. The landscape has changed dramatically following that statement, following this scope of practice. But anyway, I'll just leave it as that. I'm sorry if I went on a little rant, but hey, it's your boy Yoti, and I'm out. Salutes.